All right, good afternoon. I'm going to have to separate these two. The other thing is, I know, because people are talking. Let me try that in. Good afternoon. Um, no one told me about the dress code, so I apologize. I'm a little bit overdressed here. It happens sometimes. That's the way it goes. Anyway, if you don't know by now, I'm Alec Galmar, and I have the pleasure of serving as a Robert J. Vlasic Dean of Engineering. Collegiate professorships are among the highest honor the college bestows upon members of the faculty. They acknowledge a faculty member's contribution to research, teaching, and service, and they help us attract, reward, and retain outstanding faculty talent. Typically, these professorships are awarded and funded by the College of Engineering. And often they are named after former faculty members who have made substantial scholarly contributions while at Michigan. This collegiate professorship is named for Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Edward S. Davidson. Edward S. Davidson is internationally respected for his contributions in the areas of computer architecture, design, and performance analysis. He pioneered the pipeline techniques for improving processor throughput in both hardware and software. Professor Davidson joined the University of Michigan as a full professor of electrical engineering and computer science in 1988 after a successful career in industry and in academia. At Michigan, he served as chair of the EECS department through 1990, director of the Center for Parallel Computing from 1994 through 1997, and Associate Chair for Computer Science and Engineering from 1997 through 2000. During this period, he led research for Ford Motor Company on computational simulations of crash tests, among other things. Professor Davidson has had a long career of inspiring and nurturing many students and leaders of the field, and has trained numerous PhD students who went on to become important computer engineers in their own right. He is an IEEE former fellow and chair of ACM SIGAR, and in recognition of his leadership and significant contributions to the field, he received the IEEE Society's Harry M. Goody Memorial Award in 1992, the Taylor L. Booth Education Award in 1996, and the Eckert Mauschley Award in 2000, which was presented by the IEEE Computer Society and ACM. Professor Davidson retired in June of 2000. It is fitting we are honoring another internationally recognized leader and team player in our ceremony today. Please offer my congratulations to the Edward S. Davidson Collegiate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Dr. David Sylvester. Congratulations. Now I will uh, invite another underdressed uh, faculty member <laughs> in the name of David Blau, Kenzel D. Wise Collegiate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. I love these guys, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alec, and thank you everybody for coming today. I'm delighted to be introducing Dennis here for us today, and I want to welcome you all. Uh, especially Ching Yun and other friends and family and students uh, that have made it here today. Um, so Min Yang was going to actually give this uh, introduction, but she's on an airplane. So I was called to duty. Um, so going back, I met Dennis in 2001. Um, so for those of you that can't remember that far back, we do have some students in the audience, that's three years before Facebook. So no social media. And I had just arrived from University of, uh, I just arrived at the University of Michigan uh, as a new prof, and Dennis had just been here one year, um, and we met at Palio's for dinner uh, together with Ching Yun and my spouse Gail, uh, and we really hit it off right away. Uh, and we probably bored our spouses as we <laughs> talked about technical things and about uh, joint research projects and circuit ideas and. Um, and so that was the start of the longest and most successful collaboration that I have witnessed myself. Uh, we started to co-advise the bulk of our students, uh, which we do to till today. And um, about 80% of our papers are actually co-authored. 
Uh, so over time, our lab became known as the DD lab. Uh, David and Dennis. We don't know who's first in that list. Um, so having worked closely with Dennis uh, over the last 20 years, uh, as my colleague and collaborator and my friend, I can t attest that this uh, the award is well deserved. And uh, Dennis received his PhD from University of Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley in 1999, and then he worked for Synopsis for one year before, before coming to Michigan. Uh, Dennis is an amazing researcher. Uh, he's come up with many innovations uh, that have been adopted by industry that he will be uh, talking about shortly and that have shaped our research field in uh, lasting ways. His students have become professors uh, globally at universities uh, and many of them now compete with us in our research, often beating us. Um, he holds four distinguished teaching awards um, and he's the editor of our leading research journal, the Journal of Solid State Circuits. Um, he was also on the research council of a major semiconductor company, helping set direction there. And he started two of his com two companies of his own, Ambic, which now ships tens of millions of chips per year, um, and Cubeworks, which is realizing his vision for making ultra small uh, IoT devices. However, what I probably most admire about Dennis is that he's very broad um, in his abilities and skills. So three things. First, Dennis is incredibly connected. Uh, he knows everybody, and he remembers de details about everybody. And I can tell you this is very handy for me, especially, <laughs> because when I can't remember somebody's name, which happens about every other day, um, I just go to Dennis and I ask, who's that professor that's somewhere on the East Coast, that kind of medium high, works in asynchronous work, something like that, and Dennis will be like, okay, that's this person. Uh, and he knows who to go to and how to organize teams. Um, and on the flip side, uh, it's also true that everybody knows Dennis. Uh, and that's maybe why I'm often mistaken for Dennis. So I uh, will go somewhere and they'll be like, oh, there's one of those two professors that work on low power. That must be Dennis. Uh, so. so second, uh, Dennis has done a lot of service for the department uh, over the many years. Uh, and he's currently the senior associate department chair of EC, uh, ECE. Sorry. Um, and he's essentially Min Yang's uh, second in command. Now, if you know anything about how departments work, uh, it's the second in command uh, that has to do all the hard and ugly work. Uh, don't tell me Yang that. Uh, it's often the associate chair that has to give the bad news, uh, get people in line, uh, and Dennis has done an amazing service for our department and given very sacrificially of his time. And he's very good at it. Uh, he has a natural knack at managing and working with difficult people like professors. <laughs> so, third, and most important, Dennis is outstanding at optimizing travel. He has found the exact optimal place to park a DTW, which I still use to this day. Uh, he can tell you which app to use, to figure out which chair to sit in, in which flight. Um, he knows which booking code to use so that you get upgrades and more miles and things like that, and which combination of flights to take and across a year to make sure you get a high elite status. And so as a result, to my chagrin, Dennis has consistently ranked one level higher in Delta elite status than me ever since I've known him. <laughs> and that's a very big deal. As you know. So uh, with these endorsements, it is now my pleasure to invite Dennis to give his talk titled, A Recent History of Integrated Circuits, Bottlenecks, and Breakthroughs. Dennis. All right. Well, thank you both. Um, it's great to hear about Ed uh, Davidson. I'll talk to, about him briefly at the end of, of my talk again, but uh, thanks especially to David for the introduction and, and kind words. So um, so this is a different kind of talk. Uh, I've never given it. I just, just made it over the last couple of weeks, so we'll see how it goes. But first of all, thanks for, for coming uh, and being here for this, uh, for this ceremony, which has been delayed by COVID a couple of years. So uh, I pushed it off as far as I could, but Anne really <laughs> twisted my arm, and here we are. Thank you. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, integrated circuits. And so it's, it's a high-level talk. I'm going to talk about 
uh, some things that uh, people thought were going to bring the um, semiconductor industry to a halt, and they didn't, and why. I'm going to talk about some things I've learned over my 22 years here in terms of uh, research vignettes or lessons learned, and then I'll summarize. So a um, couple things here. Um, so I think we're mostly familiar. Not everybody here is an electrical engineer, but um, uh, most of you, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with uh, the importance of these inventions here, the transistor. Uh, invented at Bell Labs in the late 1940s, right after the war. Um, there's a picture at the bottom left. It's, it's very difficult to understand what this even is, but um, actually there's gold plates, uh, gold on either side of this piece of plastic, and there's a, a, a slab of germanium down there that's acting as the base of sort of like a bipolar type transistor. So you look at that, and you don't even understand what it looks like in terms of a transistor when we draw them normally, but that's basically what that was doing. Um, and then... Uh, and then basically, um, uh, a few years later, about 10 years later, um, uh, Jack Kilby and, and Robert Noyce um, decided that, OK, well, we're not going to just take a bunch of these transistors and wire them all together and, and make something interesting. We're going to have to put them into a, a common semiconductor substrate. Uh, and that is an integrated circuit. So all the transistors are sort of integrated together in one piece or uh, one slab, essentially, of semiconductor, whether it be germanium like it was in the first transistor or whether it be silicon like it is for the most part today. So um, this is a picture of the first integrated circuit, which also is very hard to decipher what's going on. This is a picture in my office of the patent from uh, Bob Noyce on, uh, on integrated circuits. It's a pretty influential patent, and that's why it's on my wall. Um, so you know, transistors were great. Uh, nine years from their invention, they received the, the Nobel Prize in physics, the inventors of, of the transistor, because it was so important and it was people understood how significant it was. Now, the integrated circuit was developed in the late 50s by a couple different people that are given joint credit for it, typically. Uh, Kilby and Noyce, as I mentioned. Uh, this is Jack Kilby. Uh, it took 42 years for him to be honored with the Nobel Prize in physics. And I mention that just because I think it's really striking that the transistor inventors were, were sort of recognized so quickly as saying, hey, you guys did something so great. But without, an integra without the integrated circuit, the transistor is, was, was not useless, but it was nowhere near it couldn't do anything, right? And I had, and these pictures here are showing you, this is what a transistor looks like. I mean, not today, it's an old one too, but it's a discrete thing that you wire up on a breadboard. If you want to put billions of these things together, it would be larger than this room. This thing has about 10 quadrillion transistor this wafer on. This five nanometer CMOS wafer with about 100 you know, uh, reticles on it will have about 10 quadrillion or 10 to the 16th transistors on it. So, so you can see you know, you're not going to be able to make anything complex with this. So it really was the integrated circuit invention, not the transistor invention per se, that was so significant. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Um, and then, of course, Moore's Law came around. And, and, and you know, even people on the street that aren't engineers and aren't highly technical have heard of Moore's Law. It's a significant, uh, quote unquote, law. Um, and so, in you know, 1965, Gordon Moore, who uh, was at Fairchild at the time and later was a co founder of Intel, um, basically took these data points here. And this is saying this is the, basically the number of components or transistors on a chip. Uh, or that were put together, you know, on an integrated circuit. This is remember, this is the invention of the integrated circuit. And then a couple years later, they were able to put four or eight or maybe sixteen such transistors on a uh, on an integrated circuit, and they thought that was you know that was great. And so he took a couple of these data points, literally about three or four data points, and he said, oh, it looks like a straight line on a log scale. <laughs> and then he just extrapolated out. In this case, he only extrapolated about ten years. The article was was published in 65, and he extrapolated it 10 years, and he said, well, it probably can go further. I'll revisit this in 10 years, and he did. Uh, he changed the slope a little bit, but he, you know, but otherwise he just said the same thing. And so he said, this is, you know, this is going to continue. And it did continue, amazingly, right? So this is the, the wonder of Moore's Law, is that so, so little data in such a, uh, the infancy of this field was able to more or less project forward decades and decades of progress in terms of uh, in terms of complexity. And you know, most people don't know exactly what Moore's Law says. They just know it's an exponential increase in complexity. It's, it's, it has to do with the, the maximum number of transistors you can put on a chip while being cost effective. So it's an interesting trade-off engineering. If you put too many on, and you can, 
then the chip's not going to work very well. It's not going to yield very well. It's going to it's going to be cost ineffective. So then you say, okay, I can't put that much complexity on my chip because I can't sell it for for profit. But if I put too few on, I'm underusing the, the capability of the, of the of the technology, right? So there's this sweet spot in the middle, and that's what more you know identified and saying, well, this sweet spot is going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And that's the extrapolation effort. So if you ever want to define Moore's law for someone, it has to do basically with the cost-effective number of transistors you can put on a single chip. Now, it was about 20 years from 1965 when before people started saying, well, Moore's law is dying or Moore's law is dead. So if you search on that, those phrases, you'll see a lot of hits, right? Because people have been talking about that for a long time. This is an Economist article from a while ago showing a bunch of people, some of which are somewhat famous, some of which aren't, uh, Gordon Moore has a bunch here. Bob Caldwell, who's pretty well known uh, in computer engineering, uh, are projecting the end of Moore's law. And so that's a little bit about what I'll talk about later, you know, the, the, you know, the, the bottlenecks the, uh, and the breakthroughs to integrated circuits. Um, and so there's two major reasons why people would say Moore's law would end. One would be technical, right? They would say, we just can't make transistors smaller anymore, right? There are fundamental limits to how small I can make transistors. There's atomic level limitations, obviously. Um, and there are um, economic limits, right? Uh, for instance, the cost to make a fabrication facility for the leading edge CMOS process today is on the order of 10 or maybe up to $20 billion. So there are very, very few companies that can afford to put in that sort of capital expenditure to build them. And once it becomes cost ineffective to build a new, new facility, then you're just stuck with the, the current technology and, and you can't evolve anymore. So the economic reasons uh, are the blue ones and the technical limits are the red ones, but those are the two major reasons why people say that Moore's Law is, is, going, to, uh, is going to die. Um, and so you know, where we're at today, and I'm trying to remember if it's supposed to be on this slide or the next slide, but, uh, but where we're at today is, um, you know, well, let me just go on. I, I think I, that's coming in another slide. Now that I remember. Okay, so what does Moore's Law mean to us today? What is the relevance today? Well, you know, that extrapolation effort all the way out to billions of transistors per chip and the complexity being as high as it is today. Uh, industries that rely heavily on the integrated circuit are everything almost, right? So you think about semiconductors, you think about the chip sales, that, that, that by itself is a big market, but it's not enormous. It's about $500 billion globally. That's big. Consumer electronics, which largely build off of integrated circuits, is bigger than that. It's about one to two trillion dollars. Uh, but then you get into other things like the telecommunications industry or the automotive industry. And this is showing you the percentage of a car's value, or a car's cost, I should say, that is electronics related. And so we're in the 40% range going up to close to half of the value of the car is going to be in electronics because of the electrification of cars, because of the hundreds and hundreds of chips that go into cars these days, right? Whereas it used to be very, very few. So automotive industry itself is very, very large. And a large fraction of that now is built on integrated circuits, whether they be power electronics or whether they be microcontrollers to do airbag deployment or whether they be you know, compute engines to run all the machine learning or all the different things that a Tesla will, will want to you know, do. So, so all these different industries on the order of 10 or tens of trillions of dollars are really built on the integrated circuit. Okay? A substantial fraction of the world economy really is built on that. And then you've got more recent news stuff. You know, we have the supply chain impact from the COVID uh, era. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the manufacturing facilities changing their priorities and then and no, all of a sudden no one can get cars. There's a lot of practical issues that all, you know, get down to the integrated circuit. And then more recently, the CHIPS Act, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, is a $52 billion act in the U.S. And then Europe has their own, essentially, CHIPS Act, which is basically trying to onshore or re-onshore or reshore, as sometimes they call it, uh, manufacturing uh, back to the US or back to Europe away from, let's say, Taiwan or Asia. Um, and so people are realizing that you know, that's important. We need to have this, the, the, the integrated circuit, the integrated circuit uh, industry is extremely important to the world economy, or to the US economy, or, or what have you. So this is what's the, sort of the upshot of Moore's Law and, and integrated circuits today. So. Um, I have two more slides before I get into bottlenecks, and they're sort of relevant to what we do here in Michigan. So um, David talked a little bit about some of the things that we do and that I've done, but really we've done them together. And one of the things that uh, we've, we've used as motivation 
It's a corollary in a way to Moore's law. It's a lot less known, so some of you may not know about Bell's law. Gordon Bell uh, is a computer engineer. In the early 70s, he noticed, and so that's around here, he noticed that there were these new computing systems, types of computing platforms that were coming around in the early days of, of, of computing. Uh, because in, in the very beginning, there were these mainframes that were the size of a room. And, 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 and IBM would produce these, and, and Bank would own one, and they would do some, some cr number crunching for them. And they were very expensive, right? And, and, and they weren't very numerous, not many. They sold maybe 10 a year, you know? Um, and then people worked to a mini computer, which is like a tabletop sort of computer. And then people worked, of course, eventually into the 80s, personal computers. There's a nice Apple II. Some of us remember those. Uh, and then laptops and smartphones and so on. And so you see, roughly every decade, a new um, uh, type of computing class arises, and there's really interesting characteristics of those computing classes. So Moore's law is a technology law. This is more of a, a more uh, a, a, you know hands-on or more practical law that is you know that, that consumers like us uh, really you know benefit from. And so the cost of these things goes down. Okay, obviously the cost of a uh, of a, a wearable or a, or a Nest device is a lot less than a mainframe, right? Uh, the size of the device is also a lot smaller. Okay, um, and the number of sa the sales volume is a lot higher, and this drives the semiconductor industry. If 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 all you were making was mainframes and, and and personal computers, you know, you wouldn't be filling the fabs like Apple is today with iPhone hardware, right? So, so because there's, there's one per person of a smartphone, there's billions of units sold here, you can now fill these fabs and remain, the, the industry can remain profitable. So it's really interesting. And at Michigan, we've used this law to really drive our thinking as to what we're working on. Because if you see the trends are cheaper, they're more, you know, more numerous, and, um, you know, uh, and they're small, most importantly. And that's why we've been working on these really small devices for a number of times. And we have this, this, this term here called AIoT, which is artificial intelligence of things. But the idea is that they're very small. They're going to be intelligent. They need to be untethered, meaning not wired, and things like that. So that's kind of what's next in integrated circuits, just to, to, to finish this part of the talk, in my opinion. You know, of course, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning really uh, has been very, very popular for about 10 years now. Um, and if you look at it, a lot, of the, a lot of the work there is in the cloud on servers. And these are old numbers. These are probably a year old now. But what you can see here, this is showing the processing power increasing, the, the storage costs decreasing. But if you have a really exotic um, natural <coughs> language processing model, like when you talk to Siri or something like that, um, it can cost you know, many gigawatt hours and $10 million to train that model, just to make it work, right? Um, there's no way that model is gonna fit on a small node. So we need to work on ways, so, so what's happening is a lot of the machine learning needs to work, or is working on ways to fit into smaller and smaller form factors, but still be, uh, still be effective, right? So now we're working, so people are working on edge artificial intelligence, where you have devices that are not a server, but they're light, lower power, but they're sort of still tethered. A lot of them are still plugged in. They're maybe five, 10 watts. So what we're working on is bringing machine learning and intelligence more into the you know, very, very smallest devices, still make them practical, make them cheap, make them low power, make them long lasting. So, so this is kind of what we're working on in many ways, uh, myself and some of my colleagues. I think it's really interesting. I think it's going to provide a continued wave uh, in integrated circuit development. So that is sort of um, the first part uh, of the talk, okay? Now the second part is the bottlenecks part. So this one starts to get a little more, you know, about me, perhaps, um, which I was a little bit um, unsure about talking about, but let's see. <laughs> so the first, so I'll, I'll have three bottlenecks, and this is where the, you know, integrated circuits, what's going to stop the scaling, what's going to stop the, the uh, improvements. Um, and then I'll talk about my role, if any, in, in how in some of these uh, in some of these bottlenecks or, or or breakthroughs, I should say. So the first one is just scaling, reducing the size of transistors. That's typically what we consider to be scaling. Okay. And uh, Bob Denard, really famous guy from IBM, a um, uh, couple of big inventions that he had, but uh, uh, including DRAM. So if you use DRAM in your computing systems, you can thank Bob Denard. Um, but he also introduced the concept of scaling theory, which was a pretty simple concept, which is that if you take a transistor, which this is sort of a cross-section of a transistor, and you just shrink it down vertically and laterally in every direction by some factor, everything gets better, okay? 
And, and, and it, you know, so that wasn't exactly known at the time because they, people thought maybe, okay, maybe it gets smaller, obviously. But does it get faster? Yes, it does. It gets faster. It gets faster, it gets smaller, it gets lower power. Life is really good if you just scale in this codified way. So, um, so he, he described this, and it, and it worked for a long time. And then, then people started in the 80s and 90s, started saying, well, things are going well, but um, we, can't, we can't produce things below a micron. The transistors less than a micron are just not going to work right for various reasons. But then companies figured it out, and they just kept shrinking and shrinking. And then people said, well, we can't go below a quarter micron or 100 nanometers. There's no way we can do that. There's some physical limits there. Well, it turns out they were wrong, right? So people started developing techniques, manufacturing techniques, device architectures, and materials that would allow them to keep pushing these things down. And so not to get too into the weeds, but one of the biggest developments was something called a FinFET, which is a, a, a different way of configuring a source, a drain, and a gate, which are the three main terminals of a transistor, uh, to provide better scalability to, to small dimensions. Okay? And so FinFETs became popular uh, circa 2012, I think, is when they were commercialized. Okay? Um, and I've highlighted that in bold here because that was really maybe the number one way that the scaling bottleneck has been overcome is change in the architecture of the transistor, which people didn't really think about as much uh, as then. So what was I doing? Okay, so uh, one of the things I did was the FinFET was invented when I was at Berkeley in my group. I didn't do anything about it. I had nothing to do with it, okay? But I was playing softball with people who did invent the FinFET, okay? So we, we, the, the Berkeley East Department had a softball league that was basically, the, the, the department was big enough to have its own league, okay? Well, there's Heath. Okay, so I have one of my softball uh, my <laughs> colleagues back here, Heath Hoffman. He's not in this picture, he's on a different team. <laughs> we, used to, we, used to, we used to beat his team. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, we, some of these guys in this picture uh, were developing the FinFET uh, at the time, okay? So some of the, some of the authors on the first FinFET paper are here. Uh, Suje King Liu, who's the dean of Berkeley, her, his fir her first student is in this picture on the far left. Um, things like that. So, so uh, I didn't do anything, but I also was learning enough device physics, and David knows because he sat in my class one time, and, and, and you know, so that was fun. But I taught a class, X523, many times, which is a more of a device physics course, which is not circuits, which is not um, you know, my main area, but because I was absorbing during all these softball games, all the device physics, I was able to teach that class. So that was fun. So the other thing was, um, it, early in my career at Michigan, I was also helping with something called the Roadmap. The ITRS, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. It's not so popular these days, but at that time, because of the scaling bottleneck I just talked about, people thought we we're in big trouble. Okay, how are we going to do this? And there's lots of different reasons why they thought that Moore's Law was going to end and so on and so forth. So they had these working groups of experts, whether they're academic or a lot of them were industry, that would get together and talk about how we're going to you know, identify the key challenges and, and direct resources to it and so on and so forth. So this is an example, but you know, this is from a slide capture from a talk I gave back in 2002 on this. Um, and so I was doing some of this and helping develop this and identify some of the roadmap. So lots and lots of travel. So this is where I learned all the tricks that David talked about. And so 2.4 million delta miles later, um, this is where I went. So you know, see if anybody had more. Probably. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm second here. Okay. So anyway, um, but yeah. So that was that was fun. So so basically, the bottom line is that the physical scaling challenge of transistors was overcome for a long, long time. But it is, it is fundamental that you just can't shrink them forever. So uh, we're currently at uh, about going to three nanometer is what they call it. There's nothing three nan nanometer about these transistors, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, scaling has continued for at least probably another five to, five to eight years. Okay, second bottleneck is interconnect, which is kind of a fancy word for wires. So connecting the transistors on the integrated circuit with uh, with metallization with wires, whether it be aluminum or later copper, um, this is wires or interconnect. And so um, this is really interesting. This is a slide I took from a 2002 talk I gave at um, uh, the local IEEE student chapter. Okay? And I still use this slide to kind of motivate this in my class, in some of my earlier classes and stuff. The key idea here is that scaling, like Denard theory, sm smaller transistors, because they've got, you know, the electrons have less distance to travel, and there's less capacitance to charge and discharge, then everything's faster. Now, wires 
because the, the wire, as it gets smaller, it's like it's like a hose or a pipe. It gets harder to push that water or that, little, that, that current through. It's worse. It's slower. So you, you're basically, your smaller wires are becoming slower, while your smaller transistors right next door are getting faster, and you've got this divergence effect, where the transistors are really fast, but then it takes me a long time to propagate a signal over to another part of the chip, right? So people thought this was really catastrophic. Because they thought this was going to be a big problem. Because we can't keep improving frequency and making things faster and faster if it's going to take us forever to get you know, from this adder over to this memory and then back to this and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so the solutions were um, pretty simple, actually. So the solutions were, you know what? If we want to move from one part of the chip to another part of the chip and it takes too long, if we want our clock to be continually faster, our frequency, right? When we look at our Intel chips or our Apple chips and they run at three gigahertz, we want that number to be high because we know that it means speed, right? Well, just take two clock cycles to get over there instead of one. And, and we'll work around that at the architecture level and we'll figure out how to absorb that penalty, okay? So I don't need to make the wire run faster, I just need to let it not slow down everything else, basically. Right? And so that was one of the big solutions, and that's why it's bolded here. There are other ones where we could do things in the technology, different materials. So I mentioned aluminum to copper, um, some of the dielectric materials for the insulators that add to the capacitance. Those were improved as well. So a lot of technology solutions uh, as well. So my, my contributions here, uh, actually my PhD research, since I wasn't working on FinFETs at the time, I was working on something else. I was working on interconnect. This topic, actually. So I was working on so in the 90s. It, this was a particularly an onerous challenge. So this is a picture I took uh, of the cover sheet of my thesis, um, and it, talk, it talks about analytical modeling and characterization of deep submicron interconnects. So I worked on this topic back then, and then when I got to Michigan, I continued that. Right. So um, this was early 2000s. This is my first patent, actually. This was my first student, Hamanshu, um, who. Um, was at Intel for a long time, so it was filed in 2003. So this is one interconnect, a way of trying to propagate signals faster or lower power or what have you. And so I continue to work on this topic at Michigan for, for a little bit of time, uh, not, not for too long, but I would say five, six, seven years at the beginning, uh, which of course are important years when you're a new faculty. <laughs> um, so it worked out pretty well. Um, so things moved on because they realized there were these techniques, and, and, and a lot of them were architectural in nature, right, or materials in nature. And I wasn't either of those, really. So I said, okay, let's move on to other topics. So the third one, the last one I'll mention here is, is power dissipation. And, and I put the, the years I haven't been mentioning here, but I put this ending in 2015. It's not really ended yet. This is really probably the foremost challenge we have today, which is to maintain energy efficiency of our computing systems. Okay? Um, and there's a lot of cool pictures here, so I'll talk about them each. So in the, in the early 2000s, we had the frequency wars. Okay, This is when the companies like Intel and AMD were really trying to churn faster and faster and faster. And so this, this is here is showing you clock speed in megahertz, so 100 megahertz, uh, 1 gigahertz. And this is showing you um, different parts. These are all Intel parts. But you can see, you can see you know, it's increasing. And this is a log scale, obviously, so it's, it's a fast increase. right? And then you can see around this time, and these are the particularly interesting ones. So this is the Pentium 4. This is a kind of a watershed moment in the industry where the people in the Pentium 4 got really overzealous and just decided they're just going to go crazy and just push the frequency up. And they did it by doing some insane things. And I think Todd was involved in that P4, wasn't he? I think, yeah, I should talk to Todd sometime, Todd Austin, and ask him why they did this. But maybe it was a good thing in the end because they pushed the frequency way off the, the best fit curve you can see here. And then they realized the power was ridiculous. They, 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 it was completely, the chip was almost useless because it was just so high frequency. And power goes with this equation in the middle, which is the C V squared F. So that F term is frequency. So the so the so the power on the Pentium 4 was ridiculously high. Um, and then they realized we can't keep doing this. This is unsustainable. You know, this this was this was an interesting thing, but now we're gonna have to change. And so what changed in large part was the bolded one here. They decided to move to instead of having one big, super fast so-called processor, they would build kind of usually smaller, uh, more modest processors and put them in parallel on the same chip, um, realizing that Moore's Law was giving us more density and allowing us to build bigger, you know, more, more complexity. But they would then run them at lower frequencies, okay? And then they would use parallelism 
instead of just a single high frequency, high throughput core to do work. Okay, so this is the idea of parallelism. Uh, Multi-core was the solution, and these, this core two duo, was really the first one that did that. And then, of course, all the ones now you hear about, oh, it's an eight-core system or it's a sixteen-core. That's all they do. Okay, but the frequencies, if you look at it, it's very interesting. The Pentium Four back in two thousand three could run at four gigahertz, maybe four and a half. That's almost twenty years ago. The transistors were way slower then, and it still runs just as fast as the, the, the multi-core stuff we buy today. It's about four gigahertz, three to four gigahertz. And so it doesn't mean that the design was better. You know, it's basically a lot less capable. It just means that they were doing things very differently than we do them now. We learned from that. So that was a very interesting one. Now this one up here is somebody who, for an AMD part, has removed the thermal packaging solution that was allowed, that was there to keep it cool. So if you take that off and you let it run and you run your, you just execute, maybe you're running a game and you take off that, that uh, uh, heat sink, the thing melts really, really quick. So it's just showing you, you know, what happens that you really have to spend a lot of money and attention to packaging and cooling and fans and things like that because the power on these systems is, is really, really high. And the final one is over here. This was an Intel sort of scare chart, and David knows this one very well. They, they built this, they, they, they made this slide that basically they labeled it with the power density, which is and you can't really see here, power density in watts per square centimeter. And then they showed you examples of things that are ridiculous in terms of saying, hey, if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to have you know, power densities that are really not sustainable. right? And so people used this slide a long time ago, back in this era, to motivate, hey, we've got to work on power. Um, and, and so you know, give me some money to do that, because we don't want to build these things. right? So, so that's kind of how things work. So power density or power dissipation is and still is really one of the biggest ones. So um, I hate this picture, but I, I got it and I put it up here anyway. But um, this, this, uh, what we were doing, what we were doing in this area is a lot, right? Because we, we kind of turned our attention at Michigan, not just me, not just David, not a lot of people here, uh, some of which I think Xenia left now, but a lot of people in the room working on low power integrated circuits because they're so, so critical. And I think Michigan has a, has a really great reputation in this area and it's been great. So we, we sort of helped build this ultra low power field. Ultra low power is, is basically where you know, we're, we're, we're not just talking about processors like on the previous slide, but we're talking about things like IoT and stuff like that. Things that consume milliwatts, microwatts, sometimes even nanowatts of power, which was you know, something that was not really discussed at the time. And I say from watches to watches, why did I say that? It's not a typo. <laughs> the ultra low power field, when we started looking at this in around 2004, I have a slide on this, um, was, uh, was basically in Switzerland. And they were working on wristwatches, and I just wanted to make the thing tick on once per second, right? So really, the, it was a really, really low power system. We're not talking about smartwatches. We're not talking about wearables. But now, ultra low power is talking about this. That, that's where one of the biggest markets is. So we moved from simple wristwatches, where you're just basically ticking your hand, second hand, to now doing what you know an Apple Watch or, or Fitbit do. Um, and so that's why I say from watches to watches. Um, I changed my field. We, I was doing a lot of work in design automation, and then I started working on low-level chip design. This was in part due to the fact that the, the tides were changing, funding was moving around, and just interest was, 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 was changing. And then the company thing, um, this one here is Ambic. I have a slide on them later, um, but there's been a couple companies, and David mentioned Qworks as well, that are in this ultra-low power or low power field. So we, we've definitely commercialized a lot of the technology that we've developed here in Michigan in, the, in those areas. Okay, so I think I have about um, four or five slides left. I don't know the time, actually. So, so what have I learned along the way? This is a summary, uh, but then I'll go into each of these uh, in, 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 with the one-sliders. So not every idea works as intended. Okay, Not every idea works, period. But it's also interesting to see sometimes they don't work as intended, but they, they can work for other things. So this is a cool story um, that I like, which is that we had a test chip um, or a design in 2012, and um, and we were seeing some weird behavior. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically we were seeing this signal, uh, this clock signal, and the clock was supposed to be running at some frequency, and it was running at something like three times higher frequency. But then after a while, it would magically change to the right frequency, and we were sort of puzzled about this. And some of our students, and some of them are, are, are co-founders of CubeWorks and, and still involved in a lot of this work. They, they debugged it, debugged it, debugged it, and they have hundreds of slides talking about all this stuff, and they, this is taken from that. And they finally figured out that there was a glitch 
somehow that was injecting into our clock generator another frequency. And so the clock, the clock generator, which is essentially just like a ring oscillator, just something chases itself around, which is just like this. Think about it like this. We had another edge in this ring, so they were kind of going like this. They were like two edges going around, okay? Which led to us seeing a higher clock frequency in a weird, you know, sort of waveform like this. But then eventually, due to noise, we found, in a random you know, amount of time, they would kind of catch each other and collapse into this other frequency state. So it was sort of like an unstable state where we'd have a higher frequency going around in a ring, and then all of a sudden it would just snap down to the, the, the normal value. And so we said, and one of my students actually, he's a professor at Rice now, um, said, you know what, this is a really cool thing because we can build a lot of different circuits out of this. And so we started building random number generators out of this. We started building chip IDs out of this where each chip has like a fingerprint. You can have a unique way of knowing which chip it is so you can authenticate a chip. Um, other people started building regulators, voltage, which are voltage converters out of this. And this same idea was propagated around and used in different ways. So this was a bug for this chip but it, weren't, it turned into a ripe area of research in another way. So I thought that was kind of interesting then. So keep your eyes open for opportunities like that. Um, this one is uh, more straightforward, I guess. Um, so there's a lot of famous examples. I think Nobel Prize maybe a year ago or something was, you know, I saw this on LinkedIn a lot. People were saying, oh, the Nobel Prize, the original paper for the Nobel Prize was rejected by nature. Here's the rejection letter, you know, and shows you that, you know, obviously things that are rejected are still can be very high quality work. Um, so this was not as famous as that. This is never going to win the Nobel Prize. But, um, but we, you know, my student came one time to a meeting and said, we've got a pretty cool idea on this, uh, this voltage reference. And he showed it to us. We were there probably, and we were like, you know, this, this is too simple. It's too, it's too straightforward, right? But so he was, he was trying to replace something that looks like this that provides a stable output voltage uh, across temperature and across all kinds of different things. And he wanted to replace it with something that looked like this. And these are slightly different transistors, so there's a little bit more to it. But, you know, this works extremely well to provide an output voltage that is extremely insensitive to voltage and temperature and things like that. And it works at least as well as that and consumes like a thousand times less power. So we said, okay, well, we'll let's, let's, let's just fabricate this, let's test it out, and, you know, the proof's in the pudding, and we measured it out, and we got a lot of great data, and it worked really well. So then we submitted it to a conference, our top conference, and it was rejected. And the conferences are binary, and they give you no feedback in our field. So we get a rejection, and we don't know what to make of it, right? So then we submit it to the second best conference in our field, rejected, right? So we're thinking, I mean, we knew that the idea was so simple it was going to come across like it was ridiculous, right? Um, but then finally we, we got it published, um, and a couple things here, I mean, it's been cited many, many times. It's been used in almost 200 million shipping products, okay? Um, and so it's, 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 it clearly works, it clearly has value, it's patented, that patent has never been challenged, okay? Um, so it's not as if the work had been done before. So, you know, this is something that we, we was simple, uh, useful, but we, you know, people don't believe it at first. And so we, we had to go through a long process of convincing reviewers uh, with a lot, a lot of data that this worked. So rejection, you know, should not be considered to be a uh, failure. And I think people know that, but this is just one anecdote to kind of emphasize that. Um, a couple, uh, one, one other thing here um, that I want to mention is that, uh, um, I think we're a little over time. So in my field, you can build either circuits like widgets. You can think of them as widgets, like little small circuits that are kind of cool, like the one I just talked about. Or you can build systems, right? And um, there's trade-offs there because if you, you know, widgets take a lot less resources. You can have one student work on one for six months and, and build it and, and publish a paper. And it's, it's great. Uh, and it can have value. Faster time to market, right? Systems are higher impact. They're more complex. They may be more challenging. Um, they require a lot of infrastructure and so on and so forth. And so we, you know, at Michigan, we've moved a lot into systems. And I want to thank Rich Brown and Ken Wise, neither of which are here, but um, for giving me the opportunity to work with their engineering research center years ago, early in my career. Um, the NSF ERC that was here on wireless integrated microsystem is, is kind of what opened the door for me to work on systems, working on some things with different end, end users, working on intraocular pressure monitors. It was one of my very first systems I worked on uh, within, this, within this center and working with people who at Kellogg Eye Center and just seeing the, the breadth here at Michigan and being able to work with people like that. It was really exciting. So, so when opportunity knocks like that and when Rich Brown came to me and said, I, I'm going to be taking an administrative role, you know, I'd like you to take over this for me, 
you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I took that opportunity and, and I thank him for that. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, this is some examples of some of the systems that we've built over the years, but I'm not going to spend time here because I know we're a little bit over. Um, last one is that sometimes it benefits to go to fundamental questions. Um, so this is the first question we asked when we started to work on ultra low power circuits. We didn't know we were going to work on that, but we wanted to ask a question, you know, this power problem was starting to rear its head like I talked about. And some people had started to work on solutions where in a processor they would change the voltage dynamically with, and over time depending on what you need to do to try to give you a little bit lower power when you weren't doing much and a little bit higher performance when you needed it, right? It's called dynamic voltage scaling, very common today. But back then it was brand new. And people were doing it, but they were doing it over a very narrow voltage range. And we said, well, what, what, why can't we go lower? What is the, what is the lower bound? How, how, how low of a voltage should we be operating at to maximize the energy efficiency of the circuit? So we asked that question. And this is the paper that we wound up writing on it. Um, and, uh, but the bottom line here is that this, this question was pretty fundamental and if, you, if, you, if you think about how I just couched it. But the answer led us to not just a, an interesting theoretical solution, but actually to practical follow-on work because it really did set the stage for Ambic, for instance, this company, right? Which I'll talk about next slide. But you know, basically, it, it, we started with a simple fundamental question that, that sounded like kind of theoretical, and it wound up giving us uh, decades of work, interesting work and in systems, but also commercialization opportunities. So Ambic, these are the numbers that Scott told me I could share publicly. This company, the company is still not uh, public yet, but uh, they've shipped almost 200 million chips, 200 employees, um, six highest revenue uh, generated out of the college. Um, uh, you know, so, so this, and this is the slide he gave me showing you the evolution back from Michigan work here through to where they are today. So we don't have to spend time here, but it's showing you, it, take, it took a long time, and most of this work is not mine at all, right? So David and I co-founded this company with um, my student, Scott, um, um, but we're fairly hands-off at this point, but you can see that it's all based on that first paper. It's all based on that starting question. Hey, let's work at a lower voltage than anybody else is doing. And then Scott and David and me figured out kind of how to do it, and then Scott figured out how to commercialize that. So, so that's kind of where, uh, where it led to. So I like that link from fundamental to, to commercial. So this is the final slide. Um, so a couple conclusions, you know, keep your door open, collaborate. Um, um, so this is something that uh, you know, gives me a lot of satisfaction, much more so than just working alone with my students, working with other people like David and Hunsuck and other people as well. Um, and then I think the second one is keep your mind open, expect many careers, careers in one. I think uh, David mentioned my current administrative role. It doesn't take all of my time like a deanship would take, for instance, <laughs> but uh, it has given me the opportunity to give back to the department and also uh, told me that um, while it's nice having a second office in Eeks, I never want an office in Lurie. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so it, it, I used so, to say that. <laughs> <laughs> You used to say that exactly. exactly. So, uh, so I think that's great. Great thing about academia is that you can change your job along the way as you do, it. And, and that's one way you can do it. There's other ways as well. Um, so, just to acknowledge uh, some people real quick, uh, my wife and my children. Um, so, my wife is in the front here. Thank you for your all your support. Um, St. David Blau, I've already talked about him some, so appreciate his collaboration, of course, for decades. Uh, my students. Um, and, uh, you know, I should have put all their pictures up. We have uh, a lot of alumni for the group. They're all very successful. We're all really proud of them. It's, it's really great, and they do the hard work. Uh, Ming Yan, who couldn't be here, very supportive of, of me since uh, I've taken my administrative role, and uh, I really enjoy working with her. And then Ed Davidson. So, you know, we heard all the great things about Ed. He retired in June of 2000. I showed up in August of 2000, so how do I connect to Ed? So Ed was still around. I mean, he was definitely, you know, active as an emeritus. One of the things he was active with in the early 2000s was legal consulting. So he actually got me introduced to legal consulting, which I think is pretty interesting. I've had some uh, enjoyment uh, doing those cases as well. It's another thing you can do as an academic. But what I like is that sometimes you can take, even though you have to sanitize it, you can't bring it directly in because of confidentiality. You can learn things in those cases where you can bring it back to your classroom and teach your students and say, well, it turns out that when you're changing the frequency in a, in a processor today, you can do it thousands of times per second. 
Okay, you know, kind of, you know, you have a lot of insight as to the practical, you know, um, practical capabilities in industry. So even though we're in our, our you know, um, tower here in academia, the students really appreciate it when you know more and more about industry. So you can do that with sabbaticals and spending time in industry, or you can do it in other ways. And so Ed Davidson got me involved in that a long time ago, and I appreciate him for that and other things when he mentored me early in my career. So um, with that, I think that's, that's all I have to say. Sorry for going over, but thank you very much.